really, really exciting. And so I'm going to share with you, we're going to cover a little bit about, uh, about those moon missions uh, in the 60s and early 70s when we first landed on the moon. We've actually stepped foot on the moon. Tw 12 astronauts have, uh, have uh, walked on the moon over six missions uh, between 1969 and 1972. And you can see in this picture uh, where we landed on the moon. But we're going to actually be visiting the moon at the south area of the moon because we are pretty confident there's a lot of water ice at the southern part of the moon. And wh where there's water, there's um, there's there, there could be rock, we could make rocket fuel out of the water, we could use it for drinking water, we could use it to, to, uh, to build a base, we could use that supply without having to uh, carry it with us on our way to the moon. Now, when we landed on the moon, we were pretty much in the middle area of the moon, and every sample uh, of soil and the rocks that we brought back uh, was bone dry. But again, we have found evidence of a lot of water at the south south area and actually at the north area of the moon too but we're going to be concentrating on the south area uh, when we first start exploring the moon again after 50 years uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about how we got there with the project apollo and the rockets we use the spacecraft uncrewed missions and then the crew for our for our visit and we'll we'll sort of compare how we went in the 60s uh, and 70s with project apollo to how we're going to go back with Project Artemis here in just a few years. So when, you know, when the president said uh, we are going to beat the Russians, we're going to land on the moon and return, uh, return uh, astronauts safely to the earth within the decade, uh, the first thing we had to decide is how, how to get there. How do you go to the moon? Now, probably the easiest way is just go directly to the moon. You build a large, rocket and you build a big spacecraft and you you point it at the moon you land on the moon with this big spacecraft and you take off from the moon with that same spacecraft to come back to the earth that's the direct that's the direct route probably the easiest um, there was something called earth orbit rendezvous where we could use some smaller rockets to to launch parts of a spacecraft and we would put it together, put those parts together in Earth orbit. And then once all the parts of the ship were together, we would fly to the moon. That was Earth orbit rendezvous that we considered. And the last thing we considered was lunar orbit rendezvous, where we would build a, a rocket to carry both a, an orbiter and a lander to the moon and just use, just use um, a, a separate spacecraft to land on the moon uh, and, and return all the astronauts in, in a smaller spacecraft. Now, that, as I said, the direct way to the moon would have probably been the easiest, and we would have had a spacecraft sort of like this with some astronauts at the top and huge engines, and they'd have a pretty big ladder to climb down uh, to get on to the moon. And, and to do that, we would require a huge rocket. There was a rocket called the Nova rocket, uh, which was very power, very powerful. That would that would launch this one spacecraft to the moon, but there were doubts that we would be able to build this Nova rocket within the decade that the president said we needed to get to the moon. So we settled on building the Saturn V rocket, uh, which was a very most powerful rocket still today, the most powerful rocket ever launched. Uh, and the technology to build that rocket was just within our range to, to do uh, before the end of the decade. So we built the Saturn V rocket, a uh, rocket larger than the Statue of Liberty. It was a three-stage rocket, and um, uh, we used uh, uh, some, uh, uh, some special, uh, uh, special uh, huge engines to, to be able to power this rocket. The rocket I uh, had five F, F1 engines on the, uh, on the first stage. And uh, here's a picture of one of the German uh, rocket pioneers, Werner uh, von Braun, who helped develop the Saturn V rocket. And you can see him standing at the base of one of these uh, Saturn V rockets. And you can see those engines and how, how large this rocket was. Um, so 
in order to get these astronauts to the moon, we used uh, a spacecraft called the Command and Service spacecraft. This was the Apollo capsule uh, that held three astronauts. This was the only section of the spacecraft that returned to Earth. This was a service module that it was connected to that had uh, fuel and had water and provisions, uh, communication antennas. So this ha had an engine on it also to, to, get us, uh, to get us into orbit and out of orbit around the moon. And then we had a special lunar module which consisted of two sections, a descent stage with an engine that would land us on the moon and an ascent stage where, the ast where two astronauts would, would uh, fly down to the moon. And this section had its own engine in it and would, would launch these astronauts off the moon back to that command module for that trip home. So uh, in that Saturn V rocket, in that third stage, you had the command module and service module at the top, and then you had the lunar module uh, uh, inside, carried inside this adapter of the stage. And so once the astronauts were on the way to the moon, uh, the uh, command module, command and service modules would, uh, would separate from the rocket and then they would turn their spacecraft around and dock with the, uh, with the lunar lander, both the ascent and descent stage of the lunar lander. Now that lunar lander was only made to fly in space. It was a spacecraft that could only, you couldn't come back to earth and it, it had one function and that would be to, to land on the moon. And so uh, the, these are the astronauts who, uh, who landed on the moon uh, between 1969 and 1972. You all notice they were all men uh, they were all test pilots because at the time uh, it was determined that this was such a dangerous mission that you could only send test pilots uh, to the moon. Now, the only exception is on Apollo 17, uh, Harrison Schmidt, uh, the, the astronaut, uh, the black haired astronaut there, uh, he was a scientist. Now, he became an astronaut and, and he became a pilot, but he was a scientist and they sent him to the moon uh, to, uh, to do some science while he was there. The other astronauts were trained in, uh, in uh, geology for the missions to the moon. So um, the other thing that we did for Project Apollo is we sent some unmanned spacecraft to the moon just to make sure uh, we knew more about the moon in order to land there safely. Now, the first unmanned set of spacecraft we launched were the Ranger spacecraft, and they were basically a, a spacecraft that had some cameras on it, and we would fly it into the moon, and it would snap pictures as it got closer and closer and closer, and finally it would send that last picture back before it hit the moon, but it gave us a lot of details about up close, what the moon was like up close. We also sent a series of five lunar orbiters to the moon, which circled the moon and took close-up pictures so that we could determine some of the best places to land astronauts on the moon. And all of those uh, lunar orbiters were, were very successful. Uh, this is a famous picture from one of the lunar orbiters uh, showing, the, showing the Earth for the first time, or uh, uh, Earth rise, it was called, as you see the moon in the foreground and the and the Earth in the background there. And the last type of spacecraft that we landed on the moon that were, was unmanned was called the Surveyor spacecraft. One of the things we didn't know was whether there was so much dust on the moon when we would land if we would sink into the dust. So we sent the Surveyor spacecraft to land on the moon and they all landed, uh, well, five of the seven landed successfully. And uh, this was an artist uh, picture of what it would be like for astronauts to actually walk up to the surveyor um, on the moon. And, and on Apollo 12, the, the uh, launch that uh, landed astronauts right after Apollo 11, they did just that. They landed close enough to the surveyor spacecraft to walk all the way over to the surveyor and take some pictures. They actually brought the camera, which you see here, they brought that back and some wiring 
And if you ever visit the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., you can actually see the pieces of the Surveyor spacecraft that, that they uh, brought back. And there in the background, you can see that lunar lander where they landed and in, in the big antenna that they have to communicate with the Earth. So uh, here's a, a little video of that giant Saturn V taking off on Apollo 11. Again, the most powerful rocket ever, ever launched still at this point um, to, to carry this command module and service module and lunar lander, the ascent stage and the descent stage and those three astronauts all the way to the moon and uh, allowing them to, to uh, come back to earth. So uh, it was, um, uh, you know, the, without this rocket technology, uh, we wouldn't have been able to get to the moon. Certainly not within the decade. That's the one thing that, um, where Russia failed. Russia uh, didn't have the technology to build the, the big giant engines that, that we did uh, with the Saturn V. So here's a uh, here's sort of a, a computer generated picture of the service module and the command module where the three astronauts were and the lunar module as they're getting ready to release the lunar module to let it land on the moon. And here's sort of an artist concept of that lunar module landing on the moon. There would be two astronauts. They actually stood. They, they, they didn't have seats in the lunar module. Uh, this rocket had to lift everything. So they were, they were big on, on reducing the weight of this, lunar, of this lunar lander. So they said, well, why do they need seats? They could just stand. And so they stood at these windows uh, and had a good viewpoint for this landing as they went in to, to descend to the, to the lunar surface. Now here's a picture from Apollo 11 with Buzz Aldrin getting ready to, to uh, back his way out of uh, the hatch and down the ladder to the surface of the moon. Neil Armstrong, the first astronaut to walk on the moon, uh, took this picture. And here's a picture of Buzz Aldrin on the moon. And then you could see Neil Armstrong reflected in his visor there as he snapped that picture. Now, here's a nice little video. This is from Apollo 17, one of the later flights where we took up a, uh, a lunar rover that had a camera on it. And here's a little video showing this ascent stage taking, uh, taking off from the descent stage. And there'll be a picture here that'll show the view out that window. We'll watch a little bit of this. So that was the astronauts launching from the moon. That engine had to work uh, or they would be stranded on the moon. So um, here you can see that, that ascent stage with the two astronauts coming up to dock with the command module. And then that command module would, would head back to Earth and that would be the only section that came back and designed to come back to Earth. Um, at, you know, at going about 25,000 miles an hour as it entered the atmosphere and it descended on parachutes uh, into the ocean where a helicopter and ship uh, would pick the astronauts up. So that's how, that's how the Apollo program worked. So now we're going to talk a little bit more about Artemis and how we're going to do this again. So we're going to talk about the same things. How are we going to get there? What kind of rockets are we going to use? We'll talk about the spacecraft, uncrewed missions, and then the crew for, for this Artemis mission. Well, we've decided we're going to use a modified version of that lunar orbit rendezvous. It means we're going to build a, a, a big rocket to get most of our equipment uh, on, on, on its way to the moon 
uh, without having to build something in Earth orbit or, or uh, going there directly with one giant rocket. So we are lo using lunar orbit rendezvous, but there's going to be some differences here. Um, the first thing that we're having to do is we're, we've got to build a new giant rocket. And uh, the space launch system is what we're building. Now, when you look at it, you, you're probably reminded a little bit of the space shuttle. Uh, it looks a lot like the space shuttle. It uses some of the technology of the shuttle. Uh, it uses a couple of solid rocket motors like the shuttle used, except they're a little longer. So there's an extra section in there. And actually, the four engines that you see at the bottom of this rocket, they're actually used space shuttle engines. So when they stopped the uh, space shuttle launches, they saved several of the engines and they have re, uh, uh, re repurposed them and cleaned them up. And they are going to be using these four engines on the first stage of this space launch system. Uh, it sort of looks like uh, the orange external tank of the, uh, of the space shuttle, but this is a whole new rocket uh, with a second stage up here and then uh, a spacecraft on top. And then at the very top is a little rocket to use in case there's a problem with the, with the main rocket, they could pull the astronauts off, something they couldn't do on the space shuttle. If there was a problem with the space shuttle, um, you, you couldn't get those astronauts off. It was just impossible to, to break free, uh, but uh, they've designed the space launch system to be able to pull those astronauts off uh, in an emergency. So here is a comparison of the space launch system with the Saturn V that went to the moon. Uh, the first version that we're building has a little smaller second stage, so it looks a, not quite as tall, but more powerful than the Saturn V. And then this is the next iteration, iteration of the space launch system, which has a more powerful upper stage, uh, which is, which is uh, much taller than the Saturn V. Now, when the space shuttle was brought out uh, for launch, it was brought out to a fixed launch pad that was there and standing. So they would just bring the shuttle out to the launch pad. For the space launch system, they're going to be carrying the tower and the, and the rocket uh, at the same time. So they'll go out to a pad that's sort of empty and uh, bring the tower uh, with them. They're, they actually have one tower complete for this little smaller second stage, and they're building another tower right now. Uh, they call it the mobile launch platform. Uh, so they're building another one. Uh, to handle the little larger uh, second stage. Here's a little video of what this launch is going to be. We're actually going to see the first one next year. They will launch the space launch system unmanned, uh, uncrewed uh, for the first time next year. And here's a little video of it. Should be amazing to have such a powerful rocket back in our uh, in our fleet starting next year. Well, to carry those astronauts to the moon and actually eventually Mars, we are building the Orion spacecraft. Now, the Orion spacecraft, if you look at it, it looks a little like that Apollo spacecraft. It's sort of shaped the same way because a spacecraft built that way is 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 uh, is easier to land, uh, return, return through the Earth's atmosphere. It has a service module that's provided by the European Space Agency. And it's, and you, as you can see, it has solar pa uh, panels on it to power it. Um, here's a comparison of the Apollo command module and the Orion 
uh, uh, module, the Orion spacecraft. The Orion is a little wider, a little bit taller. The Apollo spacecraft was built for three astronauts, and the Orion is built to carry uh, four astronauts uh, standard. Now here's a picture of the Orion compared to the Crew Dragon, which is up on the, on the space station right now. It, it uh, launched uh, in May on its, on its maiden launch with a couple astronauts. Now the uh, Crew Dragon can carry seven astronauts, uh, but it is made just to go into, really just to go into Earth orbit. And this is the Boeing uh, uh, spacecraft, the Dreamliner, which is, um, uh, was launched once unmanned, is going to launch again later this year unmanned, and will eventually carry astronauts up to the space station, and it can carry seven astronauts as well. Now, the Orion has launched once uh, unmanned, and again, it's going to launch unmanned again on a, on a trip around the moon uh, next year on that space launch system for the first time. Here's a little video talking about uh, how those astronauts will launch uh, on the Orion spacecraft on that space launch system. This is their deep space human rated spacecraft called Orion, built in three parts. The crew module, where up to four astronauts will live and work throughout the flight. The service module, with life support systems for the crew and its own engine and fuel reserves. And a launch abort system with engines capable of pulling the crew module to safety during launch should anything go wrong. To accomplish the task of launching our crew in heavy payloads, NASA is building the Space Launch System, comprising of a cargo hold, an exploration upper stage, a massive core stage, and two extended solid rocket boosters. Altogether, this is the world's most powerful rocket, and it exceeds the legendary Saturn V of the Apollo era in numerous ways. Sitting on the launch pad, the entire rocket, fully fueled, weighs just over 6 million pounds, 5.2 million of which is just the fuel. Once ignited, there is no stopping when it comes to this. All four RS-25 engines and the two solar rocket boosters come to life, thundering our crew upwards. Two minutes after ignition, the solid rocket boosters are spent and released. Eight minutes after launch, the core stage is depleted and separated. The upper stage fires briefly, placing Orion into a parking orbit around the Earth. Here, the crew reconfigure the spacecraft and check systems to confirm everything is ready for deep space travel. With a go from mission control, the crew reignite the exploration upper stage engines to leave Earth entirely. The exact timing of this maneuver is critical to reach a speed that can escape Earth's gravitational pull, but also put Orion on a course that will intersect the moon days later. Once this burn is complete, the upper stage of the SLS is jettisoned and the crew aboard Orion coast for several days toward all that awaits them at the moon. Okay, well, this is where the trip to the moon on Apollo gets a little different than how we're going to go with Artemis. With Apollo, we had that command and service module that uh, brought the lunar lander to the moon. And then actually one astronaut stayed aboard the command module while two of the astronauts got into the lunar lander and, and went to the surface of the moon. And they spent with Apollo 11 from less than a day to up to Apollo 17, they spent three days on the moon. But we're not, we're not gonna do it that way this time. We're going to the moon uh, for the long term, for the long haul. And we're going to do that with something we call the Gateway. The Gateway is like a mini space station in orbit around the moon, in permanent orbit around the moon. Now, uh, we do have a space station right now uh, uh, orbiting the Earth that's, that's, been, uh, that's been crewed all the way since the year 2000, so permanently crewed for 20 years. But the gateway isn't going to be permanently crewed. It is built to support uh, four astronauts for about 30 days. Uh, so it has a power and propulsion module and a communications module to, uh, to uh, provide power and communications to Earth and, and any of the spacecraft on the lunar surface and some engines to keep it in orbit. It has a habitation module, a place where the astronauts can, can live. 
It has a spot where they can, uh, we can send supplies with unmanned, uncrewed rockets, can send supplies to dock with that station. And then here you see the Orion spacecraft dock to this, dock to this station. And you can also see a, an arm that's going to be provided by the Canadian Space Agency to help connect these modules as they come up for, uh, for resupply. But we will eventually uh, dock a lunar lander to this station. So the astronauts will dock with this little mini lunar gateway, get, it, get into the lunar lander, and then go down to the surface of the moon. And then when they're done with their stay on the moon, they'll fly back up to the space station. And then they'll get back in their Orion and head back to Earth. So by using a lunar gateway as a stopping point, uh, we have a we have a permanent we can have a permanent presence out in lunar orbit, and eventually use this station as a spot to build a, a space a big spacecraft to to eventually travel to Mars. So this this uh, lunar gateway will be at what they call a Lagrange point. Now, a Lagrange point is a spot where the, the Earth and the Moon and the Sun, the, the gravity of all these three objects balance each other out. So you can put something at a, at a Lagrange point and it sort of stays where it is. You don't have to use a lot of fuel to maneuver it. Uh, the James Webb telescope that's replacing the, the uh, Hubble uh, that we hope to launch next year uh, is going to go to this Lagrange point two, and so is this station. It's going to be built at Lagrange point two. Now it's a, you know, it's not going to be that crowded. Even with the uh, web and and a space station up there, there's a lot of room uh, in this in this spot. But that's where the station will be. And here's a little video that's going to show the crew arriving at the gateway. And this is an example of a lunar lander here. And it shows how, how this mission to land on the moon will work. Once on board, pre-selected crew members transfer to the lunar lander, while those assigned a gateway remain on station. The lunar lander system itself is built for three unique steps. Descending from the halo orbit of gateway down to a low lunar orbit, descending from low lunar orbit to the surface, and once the lunar mission is complete, launching from the surface of the moon and ascending all the way back to the orbiting gateway. Once back aboard the Orion spacecraft and undocked from Gateway, the crew fire their engine once to break out the halo orbit, and once again to swim the spacecraft around the moon, placing it on a multi-day trajectory back towards Earth. As they near the end of this journey, the service module is released, and the crew module is oriented heat shield first. Entering Earth's atmosphere at 25,000 miles per hour, the friction of air slows Orion considerably, while also subjecting it to temperatures of 5,000 degrees. With the Orion now at just 300 miles per hour, a series of parachutes uniquely tested and produced for this moment deploy, decelerating the craft to just 20 miles per hour for splashdown. So the Orion goes from 25,000 uh, miles per hour to 20 miles per hour. Now, uh, to compare that, uh, the space shuttle, when it re-entered the atmosphere, it re-entered about 16,500 miles per hour. They actually did some studies to see if they could, if you could send a space shuttle around the moon uh, with, with enough extra fuel and uh, for, its, for its engines. And really, the, they, they could, but the issue would be returning. The space shuttle wasn't designed to come in at 25,000 miles an hour. Uh, as the Apollo and as the, the Orion spacecraft uh, would. The other thing is the Orion spacecraft can actually land on land as well. So uh, uh, it will either land on the ocean or, or land. Well, the last piece of the puzzle here is to design a new lunar lander for landing astronauts on the moon. Now, for our landing in 2024, uh, the lander has to, has to handle two astronauts for about a week on the surface. Uh, so they'll spend a week on the surface, probably do about five spacewalks, um, maybe an hour for the first spacewalk on the surface, uh, and then uh, three more walks, um, six, 
six or seven hours each. Uh, each time they'll go a little bit further out. Uh, we might land some rovers uh, on the moon eventually, we will. Uh, but for that 2024 mission, uh, we're looking at maybe landing one rover to take those ast let the astronauts explore a little bit of the surface. Here are the three um, examples of the of the contracts NASA has let out to to do some studies uh, for lunar landers, and they're 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 similar and different at the same time. Uh, this one is a lander developed by a company called Dynetics, uh, which is based in Alabama. Now. It is interesting in that it is totally reusable. Uh, and the astronauts, really, they are, the hatch is very close to the, to the ground, which makes it very convenient for them to get out and get back into their spacecraft. Um, you, you see that it's solar pa powered. So these, these are almost like blinds that unfold. We use that technology on the space station and on the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, so, when they got when they landed on the moon they would unfurl these solar panels and when they got ready to leave they would pull them back down and then uh, launch the, this entire unit back uh, back to the uh, gateway so this is this is a company this is dynetics who's working on this uh, type of lunar lander uh, this interesting uh, lander is by spacex uh, SpaceX is working on something called the Starship, a massive rocket, a fully reusable two-stage rocket where the first stage is reused and the second stage is reused. And this is a actual Starship portion of that, which would be almost the second stage of the rocket. Uh, and they have been given some money from NASA to study using this Starship uh, to land on the moon. Now the Starship has several engines on its base, but they would be too powerful to land on the moon. They would kick up so much dirt and rock, it would, it would, it would put a crater in the moon when they try to land. So they would have to use some engines on the side. They kind of look like lights, but these would actually be engines to help land this uh, spacecraft on the moon. And then they would have a long ride from the top all the way down to the, to the uh, surface of the moon. Uh, so it's an interesting concept and SpaceX is looking at that. And this last uh, spacecraft design is from Blue Origin, which is the space company uh, run by Amazon, who, who's working with Lockheed Martin and North, uh, Northrop Grumman. Now Northrop Grumman is the company that built the lunar lander so they have a lot of experience building, uh, building these systems. Now it's a two-stage lunar lander. Here you can see in the background kind of the descent stage. So this is where the astronauts would be in this top section and they'd have a long ladder kind of along the back to climb down to the, to the surface of the moon. And then when they went to leave the moon, an engine here at this section would separate these two sections and they would go back up to the lunar gateway. So NASA awarded three contracts to these companies to, to design this lunar lander. And they have, uh, um, you know, unlike the 60s when NASA built everything and NASA was in charge of everything, they're, they're trying to get private companies to, to build these spacecraft. Um, they will probably narrow it down to two companies and have two competing ways to get to the moon. Uh, which uh, it's always good to have some competition and to have uh, some alternatives in case one, one way doesn't work out. Uh, but they're on a tight schedule to have this ready by 2024 uh, to make this first moon landing. Uh, NASA's also done some unmanned spacecraft the last few years uh, and upcoming um, to, to learn a little bit more about the moon and the water on the moon. This was a spacecraft uh, called uh, LaCrosse that was launched in 2009. And what LaCrosse did, it used the empty rocket stage that launched it to the moon. They aimed that rocket stage at the moon. And once it, once it hit the moon, it threw up debris that included water, ice, and then LaCrosse flew through that debris and sent back 
information about that debris before it crashed into the moon as well. And Lacrosse was able to verify that there was water uh, that was that was hit. What we think is there, there's water in the shaded areas of the moon, like some of the craters that don't see sunlight. So again, that's where we're going to land. We're going to land in the southern part of the moon. Now on that same rocket in 2009, we also launched the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is still operating around the moon. We expect it to last another seven to ten years, providing really detailed uh, looks at the moon so that we can plan our new landings uh, on the moon. Um, it's almost like a spy satellite around the moon with the details that this, that this orbiter gives us. For example, the Apollo 17 where we saw those astronauts launch uh, in that video a little earlier. Here you can see the descent stage um, from that Apollo 17 launch. That lunar, that lunar rover that sent that video back from us is parked over here. And then you could see the tracks that the uh, lunar rover made as these astronauts explored the moon on Apollo 17. So it's amazing uh, uh, what kind of pictures that uh, this uh, lunar reconnaissance orbiter sent back to us. Now, in 2023, NASA has partnered with a company called Astrobotic uh, out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, to land a rover called the Viper rover on the moon in 2023. So this is their, uh, this is their lander and this is the uh, rover. And this rover is designed to, to sample the moon and find those core samples, find that ice. And uh, this, you know, the, where they land this, uh, this Viper, which stands for Volatile Investigation, Investigating Polar Exploration Rover. They have to have a acronym for it. Uh, but it's going to look for that ice and uh, set the stage for our man landings the next, uh, the next year. And I probably shouldn't call it manned. I should just call it crude landings. If you, if you think back to the 60s, uh, where the astronauts, it was, it was an all-male uh, test pilot group who landed uh, landed on the moon, went into space. Well, that's not going to be the same for Project Artemis. Uh, there will be a, a, a female astronaut as part of that first crew uh, landing on the moon and probably will, will command the mission. And one of these four astronauts uh, might be one of the first to actually land on the moon and uh, that will be a long time coming, and uh, it's exciting to to show that anybody can uh, uh, who works hard and and does a great job and and excels uh, can can accomplish something like landing on the moon. So one of these female astronauts will probably be one of the first people to go on to the moon uh, with uh, Project Artemis. All right, well, I've been talking for a while. I wanna give you a status update here, where we are with, with, our, with our trip to the moon. Um, the first thing is the Orion spacecraft is tested and ready for its first unmanned launch around the moon next year. So this is a, this is a, a picture of it in, in the test facility where they make it as cold as space and make it as warm as the sun shining to, show, um, to uh, show that the spacecraft can survive uh, those harsh elements. Uh, you can see the solar panels folded up on the side, so they're ready to go with the, with the Orion spacecraft. This is the first stage of the space launch system. Uh, they just finished it, and you can see they're getting ready to load it on this barge. Uh, here's the four space shuttle main engines uh, on it. Now, they have taken, taken it to uh, Bay St. Louis, Mississippi, uh, to the Cine Space Center where they are testing the rocket. So they are actually going to fire the rocket for the full eight and a half minutes that it will fire when, it, when, it's, when it's used to uh, send the, the uh, Orion around the moon. So uh, now they will, it's clamped down so it can't leave the earth. 
But uh, they call that the green test, where they test it, they make sure it works. We did the same thing with the Saturn V rocket. We tested every Saturn V stage to make sure everything was perfect. And then they'll put it back on a barge and take it to the Kennedy Space Center for launch uh, next year. And at the Kennedy Space Center, the sections of the, of the solid rocket boosters that, uh, that will be at the side of that space launch system started arriving. And so these are the special train cars that hold the different sections of those solid rocket boosters as, they, uh, as they'll sta start stacking them uh, along with the uh, rocket that we just saw. Now, as far as the gateway goes, uh, NASA has put the contract out for that uh, lunar uh, gateway power and propulsion element. So they're going to launch uh, unmanned. They're going to launch the power and propulsion element, the first couple elements of the space station, the lunar gateway, uh, as one piece. And it's probably going to launch on a Falcon Heavy rocket that SpaceX uh, uh, builds and uses. So that should launch in 2023 uh, to start building that gateway up for our landing on the moon. And again, as far as the lunar lander, uh, NASA hasn't decide, decided which company and which design to go with yet. Uh, there are actually four companies had had uh, brought something to the table, but they selected these three companies uh, for their designs. So they should be awarding next year, they should be awarding one or two uh, contracts to uh, probably not all three, but at least two of the companies will start building this lunar lander uh, for the Artemis project uh, to, to uh, get our astronauts on the moon by 2024. And uh, Again, we are going to the moon to stay. We're gonna build that gateway. We will be launching unmanned uh, spacecraft down to the moon. We'll be launching, uh, we'll be landing uh, rovers. Some of them, uh, some of them astronauts will, will ride in spacesuits on. Some of them will be pressurized rovers that allow them to, to drive many, many miles on the moon as we, as we learn how to use the moon's resources and, um, and practice for our eventual, eventual trip uh, with the Orion spacecraft uh, out to Mars. And uh, here's a picture of maybe one day uh, 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 landing on Mars uh, and, and exploring Mars, sort of the dream of, of, uh, of mankind for many years. So uh, I hope you uh, learned a little bit about how we are planning to go back to the moon uh, it's just around the corner, you know, 20, we're almost through 2020, and we'll be glad to be through 2020 uh, soon, but we will be, uh, uh, you know, landing on the moon uh, 2024, and uh, then we will have a mission each year after that, so 2025, 26, 27, 28, and 29, uh, NASA's building the parts and getting the people ready uh, for for, for uh, landing and exploring the moon should be quite exciting. So with that, um, uh, Donna, do we have any questions? We do, Joel. We have quite a few, and um, I'm afraid it's going to take us over our time, but we will, I will try to condense them and um, perhaps focus on, uh, there's lots of interest, but I will try to focus on the questions that relate specifically to this program. And if we have time, then I'll cover others. But I just lost my chat. Ah, there it is. Okay. So, uh, one of the questions is: Is it safe to go up into space? And I, I think there were some other questions related to this about tragedies that may have happened. Um, Perhaps you could speak to that. Um, it, it's always dangerous. It's always dangerous going up into space. You're leaving the earth, which is uh, our home and uh, our human bodies aren't really designed to go into space. Uh, so it's exciting, but it's dangerous. Now the moon, it's a three day journey. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, when, when we're up at the space station, 
we're, you know, 250 miles up, we can come back within three hours, we can get back in an emergency. Uh, the moon's a little further. Uh, it, 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 you know, if something happened, let's say somebody's um, appendix burst or something like that, they, they could come back from, from the moon, but it would take a little longer. It'd take at least three days to get back from the moon. When you start talking about going to Mars, uh, right now with the technology that we have right now, that's at least a six, seven month journey one way to Mars. So uh, coming back, uh, you couldn't just come back. Well, so it, it is dangerous. Uh, one of the most dangerous parts of the journey is, is radiation. And, uh, you know, our Earth protects us from a lot of the radiation from the sun. Even the space station is in a low enough orbit where a lot of the Earth's atmosphere and the Van Allen radiation belts protect us, the astronauts up on the space station, from some of the harmful radiation. But as you're, you know, going to the moon, uh, or you're going out to Mars especially, it, it, it is dangerous. So we're looking at some new technologies. One of them is called active shielding, where we would kind of, uh, uh, we would have fields that would push that radiation away. There's also uh, material you can use, like water is a good insulator for uh, radiation. So on a trip to, to Mars, you might have a section of the spacecraft that has water around it. And, and if you knew there was going to be like a, a solar flare from the sun heading your way, you would go into that section. But it's certainly something that we are, are struggling with. Uh, one of the best things to do is cut the time down. If you could cut the time to Mars down to maybe uh, four weeks, that would be a lot safer. You wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, have as much radiation exposure as, uh, you know, six, seven months. So uh, there are uh, scientists looking at, looking at that, but it is dangerous. Anytime you leave the earth, uh, it's dangerous, no matter how safe your systems are, um, you can never be 100% safe. So it, it is a dangerous profession uh, going into space. Okay, the next question um, talks about the Artemis crew. And the crew members have generally come up through the U.S. military. Do astronauts today come up through other channels? Yeah, uh, a lot of the astronauts, um, well, there was a big change when the space shuttle flew. Uh, your commander and your pilot were usually, uh, usually test pilots, uh, but uh, a lot of the astronauts who flew uh, the rest of the, the, you know, with the rest of the crew were scientists. Uh, some of them were medical doctors, some of them were astronomers. Um, so it's not really a field where you have to uh, be uh, uh, someone who was in the military to become an astronaut anymore. Uh, a lot of the astronauts aboard the space station uh, today are just scientists and they enjoy what they do and uh, they're the best at what they do and they do their work up on the space station and it will be the same thing with with the moon. Uh, I would think a geologist would be a good choice to go to the moon, just like Harrison Schmidt, that uh, geologist who went to the moon uh, on Apollo 17. That's who we will want to send uh, up to the moon uh, and on, on to Mars. So uh, it, 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 in, the, in the 60s, in the 60s or 70s, it was pretty much test pilots, but uh, the shuttle kind of broke that mold and uh, uh, the other thing is a lot of be be a lot of international uh, people go with us to the moon. Uh, Europe is helping us uh, build that gateway. So is Canada. Uh, so is the Japanese space agency and the Russians. And so it'll be an international crew uh, visiting the moon and and actually uh, going on to Mars. So that's uh, that's a good thing. Okay, there are a few questions that I'm going to consolidate. It they have to do with gravity things that you can do on the moon, uh, building on the moon, painting on the moon. Um, tell us a little bit about working in that kind of environment. Well, the, moon, the moon's gravity is not as much as, as the gravity on Earth. So uh, you have mass, but you're able, to, uh, you're able to get around a lot easier. Uh, the astronauts found on the Apollo, uh, in the Apollo program, they found that uh, kind of jumping like a bunny rabbit and hopping 
was uh, was an easy way to get across the surface uh, of the moon. Uh, actually, the, uh, the lunar rover that they carried up to the moon was very lightweight. Uh, there was a story of one of the astronauts, they had the lunar rover parked on the side of a hill and it started to slide down the hill. And the astronaut had to hold, imagine holding your car still so it didn't slide down the, uh, the, the, the side of the hill. Uh, so it is, uh, the, you know, the gravity is, is a lot less. And that's why, you know, building a base on the moon, using the resources of the moon, it, it, there's a lot less gravity, so it doesn't take as much power to push it off the moon. Uh, in theory, you could use almost like a big slingshot to send things up off the moon in, in, into orbit. So imagine uh, gathering that water on the moon and, and turning it in, having machines that turn that water into hydrogen and oxygen for fuel, and then sending that fuel up to the gateway uh, and collecting that fuel at the gateway to fuel a, a, a rocket then that will leave for Mars, maybe a rocket that will do a figure eight between Mars and the Earth, all fueled from, uh, from the water uh, mined on the moon and maybe even using the materials of the moon to, 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 to uh, build structures that can be part of this ship. Uh, so a lot of interest in using the resources on, of the moon. It's, it'd be so much cheaper to get those resources and move them off the moon than to launch them from Earth. That's one of the biggest drawbacks is the cost to get a pound of material off, this, off the surface of the Earth is, is very expensive. And it would be a lot cheaper uh, if that material was already there on the moon that you could get. That's, uh, you know, they talk about uh, asteroids, mining asteroids. If we could find some asteroids that have uh, precious metals and things, it would be cheaper to mine them out there than, uh, you know, than to get that material off the Earth. Okay, great. Um... I have a question here. What was the time frame for developing the lunar lander? Well, uh, the president said that he wanted us on the moon by 2024. So the time frame is by 2024. And it, between now and then, that, that system will have to be designed uh, and it will have to be tested at least once before they would put a crew on it. So that's a very, um, very it's a very tough time frame. Um, but what they're trying to do is use, uh, instead of NASA doing all this, NASA would be the customer and private industry would build this. And um, they think by using private industry, they can get these things accomplished much faster than if NASA was going to build it and design it themselves. For example, the, the gateway um, they, they took some companies that had experience building solar panels and building uh, 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 engines and gave them the contract and said, get this thing built. We need it. We need it for the gateway. So they have started building the, the propulsion and, and, um, and, and power module for that lunar gateway. Um, the companies that are involved in the lunar lander uh, have been working on this for a while. They've been do, they've had some contracts to design this these systems, um, so they've got they've got a jump start, but it will be tough to get this done in the time frame we're talking about uh, by 2024. So it is uh, it is a tight uh, time frame, but by using private companies, NASA hopes to be able to um, uh, accomplish getting the, this ready in time. Uh, to land by 2024. Uh, I might add too, there are other countries that have their sights on landing on the moon with, with astronauts, China being one of them. And that's one of the, I think one of the reasons you see a lot of interest right now in, in the Americans going back to the moon. Uh, China has uh, landed rovers on the moon and uh, they're getting ready. Uh, they, they've had small space stations. They're getting ready to launch another space station. And their objective is to, to, uh, to go um, explore the moon. So I think that's part of the reason you see that interest. Um, but you know, someone would have said in 1961 that we, there's no way we could get to the moon 
uh, by the end of the decade. So, you know, it's, it's great to have a goal out there and, and it's amazing what you can accomplish when you put your, your mind to it. And America did this once. And I'm sure we could, if we wanted to land on the moon by 2024, we could, we could uh, get the technology ready to do so. You know, we, we've done it before, but again, we don't want to do it and throw it away. We want to uh, build this technology so that we stay and we, we don't have another 50 year absence from the moon after the 2020s. Okay, um, NASA has redundancies for critical maneuvers like engine burns. Are there two or more? Well, um, so when the, when the spacecraft heads out to the moon, they'll start on what they call a free return trajectory. So once they head out to the moon, they almost do like a figure eight. If, if something goes wrong with the engine and they can't fire the engine, they will go around the moon and come back to earth without having to do anything. Once they've checked out that like the engines and everything's working well, then they will fire their engine to first to go into that halo orbit to, uh, to, to get to that lunar gateway. Uh, so they, they, do, they do their planning uh, in case something goes wrong. At some point though, uh, you, you don't have redundancy. You know, uh, for example, uh, we, we talked about the lunar landers on the moon. That, that ascent stage has to work. Now, when they built that lunar lander, um, they didn't have two engines, but they had two separate fuel systems, and they used fuel that all they had to do was put the two fuel, the two components together, and it would burn. They made it as simple as possible. But even if the smallest thing, like the, the, the guillotine, that had to cut the descent stage, like all the cables from the ascent stage and descent stage and had to cut them all right when they launched. If something went wrong with that, they would be stranded on the moon. So you can be as redundant as you can. You can make things as safe as possible, um, but you're never gonna have something perfectly 100% safe. And so there's always gonna be danger on any of these systems. Hopefully they've built enough redundancy in uh, to, to protect the astronauts uh, in case there is a problem. But, you know, when you're talking, especially when you're talking about going to Mars and leaving the, leaving the Earth and on a journey of months, um, there's a lot of room for things to go wrong. So it's, uh, you know, you, you consider that uh, when you sign up to, to go. But I'm, there's always a lot of people who would be will, willing to take that risk uh, for, for science and the adventure of it. Okay, uh, will the Orion be reusable? Uh, the, the Orion is designed to be reusable, to be refurbished. Uh, they can put a new heat shield on it. It uses a, a heat shield that ablates along the bottom. Um, when you think about the space shuttle, space shuttle use tiles that shed the heat away and, 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 and they, you know, they, had to, they had to repair tiles, they had to replace some tiles. Mm -hmm. But uh, the Orion's going much faster when it hits the atmosphere, so it's using a heat shield. But it's a re it's a replaceable heat shield, and actually on the sides of the Orion, it uses a shuttle tile type material, and so that would be reusable as well. So uh, the plan is to reuse them. Uh, it's interesting the um, you know SpaceX who builds the Dragon with those two astronauts uh, took up uh, took off to the space station. Um, uh, at first, NASA said oh, you have to have a brand new Dragon spacecraft every time you launch, launch astronauts. NASA now has said, you know, um, you, you know, show us you can demonstrate you can reuse these a couple times and we'll let you reuse the uh, Dragon spacecraft. So NASA's warmed up to uh, reusing the Dragon spacecraft. And look at SpaceX, who reuses their first stage. Um, it's amazing how much they've lowered the cost of getting... Uh, of getting satellites and materials up into space by reusing that first stage. Something that we would have said a few years ago was impossible is now uh, is, is uh, common to see, uh, to see that first stage come back and land on land or, or land on that drone ship uh, to be reused. Uh, and NASA has warmed up to reusing those uh, rockets to launch astronauts as well. Because I think, 
I think SpaceX has proven that uh, they can fly those uh, vehicles safely with a little refurbishment. So uh, the Orion uh, will, will be re, re, uh, reused uh, as they need to. But you're talking, you know, it's that space launch system is an expensive rocket to launch. Uh, so we're probably talking at least, at least through the 2020s, we're talking about one mission a year. Uh, whereas in the Apollo days, uh, when we were leading up to that first landing, we were doing maybe four, four flights a year. And then the last ones we, we did a couple a year. Uh, this would be one a year uh, for the time being uh, with, a, with a seven, seven day stay uh, on the surface to begin with. All right, Joe, we'll, we'll make this our last question. I'm combining um, those of a couple of people. Is the COVID-19 affecting the schedule and have people continued to work on the Artemis program throughout the pandemic? Well, it has affected it. That, um, that green run that I talked about where they're testing that space launch system, uh, it, it added some delay to that. The space launch system, they were hoping to do that. When I say the green run, that's the full firing of, that, of those four engines for eight, eight and a half minutes. Um, that was supposed to be accomplished and, um, and, and be done by the end of the summer. That looks like it will go late into the fall, uh, which again, we're hoping that that test, that test uh, uh, of that, of that um, space launch system stage goes well and they get it, on, uh, get it on the container ship and get it over to the Kennedy Space Center for stacking. So it has delayed that. We're probably talking uh, summer of next year at the earliest before we will launch that uh, Orion unmanned uh, to the space station or to, uh, to the moon. Um, that's been the main delay with Artemis. Again, they, are, they, they have the Orion ready. The space launch system has been the big delay. It was supposed to be ready about three years ago. And uh, it's difficult to, to build a new spacecraft. And uh, a new rocket system. Now this was built by NASA to NASA standards. And again, this is where they hope that the private companies that are building the lunar landers, they're, they're hoping they can stay on schedule and they can get it done quicker than, than, than uh, NASA taking it over. Um, but it, it has delayed it a little bit. Uh, reminds me, one thing that didn't get delayed uh, is the uh, Perseverance rover, which will be launching to Mars later this month. Now, there has been a little delay uh, because of some, um, some contamination they wanted to clean up and, and some rocket issues they were working on. So they have about a three week window to launch this rover to Mars this summer or else they got to wait a couple years. So people continue to work on the, the rover as safely as possible because again, this was something that if you don't launch in July, you're waiting a couple years to launch. And so uh, there's some dedicated people who worked on that. Be watching for that at the, at the end of this month, this uh, per Perseverance rover uh, going to Mars. It's, gonna find, it's going to uh, drill uh, core samples and, and drop them off so we can send a mission to go collect those core samples and bring them back to Earth, uh, which will really be a, kind of a dream come true to bring some samples back to Earth. Uh, it's also carrying a helicopter to Mars, which is kind of cool to see a little drone helicopter fly on Mars. Um, so that's one thing that, um, that people worked through the, the coronavirus uh, issues to uh, to make sure that that was on track. So that's getting ready to launch later this month. Well, thank you, Joel. We can't wait for that. I know it was delayed. I think today um, they said it would be delayed until the 30th, but we're looking forward to that. It's pretty exciting. For more information on that, you can follow NASA online. Just put in the name NASA Mars mission and you'll get more than you could do in a daytime. So um, you can try that. Also, the library has a pretty good astronomy section. So stop by here and um, put in your request. And we have curbside pickup. We also will be opening to um, browsing soon. So watch our website for that and our messages on Facebook. 
So with that, I'm going to close for tonight. Thank you, Joel, very much. Thank everybody for their, their questions and um, for participating in this. Again, Joel will be back in August on the 4th. Women in Space, don't miss it. Mark it on the calendar tonight. And we'll have more program announcements coming up soon. Thank you very much, and we'll say good night.